Hi, thank you very much for attending today's seminar by Ke Chiang in our lab. So as some of you may know that Ke Chiang has been working on a project called CoolMap. So the main goal is to develop a visualization application that will help bench biologists to explore and analyze their data more efficiently. So Ke Chiang has made great progress in uh, advancing the CoolMap. And he is now branching it into a project that uh, to build an interactive visual platform that will allow people to uh, inspect and analyze their data from different perspectives. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Ke Qian. I, I work for Fan on, a, uh, on an application called CoreMap. As Fan said, it's a data analysis and uh, visualization tool. Um, and uh, we have a couple of slides. Uh, uh, in my PowerPoint today to recap what CoreMap is because we have given a seminar like last year at Tech, tech and uh, tech, Technology and Tools seminar. <coughs> and uh, yeah, we're going to take a look at what CoreMap is later. So actually our topic today, uh, if you guys don't mind, can I just sit down because yeah, I have a demo to show later. Yeah. So our topic today is called is cross application data exploration through our shiny. So we have we got a lot of logos on it. <laughs> so uh, basic, I I don't know like how many of you guys have ever used R. Like I, I would assume like yeah most of you guys use R, but I don't know if you use R shiny. If you have used R shiny, can you raise your hand? Okay, just one, two, three. Yeah, three. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I actually just got started with our, our shiny as well, and uh, yeah, I'll just give like a basic idea what it is and how you can incorporate it into your application. I'm sorry, could you, could you mirror the shell? Oh, okay. Um, so just not use yeah presenter view. Yeah. Mm. Oh, well, when did the shell then? I don't know which one is that. That's still. Yeah, maybe that is. <coughs> okay, cool. So, first, let's take a look at our motivation. So, why do we need cross application exploration? So, a lot of times you find you want to see or like investigate your data through different perspective uh, different pers perspectives it's it includes like plotting different like graphs it's also like involve different types of analysis and using different tools by different tools it might be just a like a little script or it might be a whole application so that's why uh, that that's also like brings up another like problem because each application only addresses some possible data analysis needs or it only do some sort of like plottings or analysis. Excuse me, question here. Uh -huh. So by cross application, do you mean like a general purpose for any kinds? Of yeah, that's the goal we we are trying to do. Yeah. 
yeah, you're gonna get a better idea of it. Yeah. So for multiple applications, we want real-time inter interactivity. So it will first increase the scope and depth of the data exploration as well as the speed, like it speeds up your exploration. And uh, it also enables the researchers to test like many parameters and ideas. You just go back and forth in different applications and to see uh, you know, what changes in this plot affects like another thing in that other application or other analysis. So the major ch challenges we we now facing is first is the lack of real time interactivity. So we usually use different applications for sequential analysis. Like you process the data in one app and you pass it to down to another application and do something and maybe output to a file or something. You read it into another application. Just do things like that. So. The other way we have available now is using some application APIs. For like Centerscape, it comes with a RESTful service. So basically, you can from other application, or you can just call the APIs from a browser to get the data, or or send a, like a network or something to Centerscape. So it this is only bilateral interactive though. Yeah. So what we need here is something that would comes as a central point and it serves as a central point for gaining data and dispatching operations and also aggregating the results from two different applications and it can also be extended to more applications <coughs> so that's why shiny comes into place so Shiny is a R package. It's actually R Studio package developed to um, use for like write web applications. So it comes with UI components handy for you to use. Uh, it also supports all the R libraries as like such as ggplots. So it's a pretty good tool not only for creating the UI components on a web browser, it also enables you to use R scripts, like analysis functions, and R plottings as well. So the reason to use Shiny, it's a lot. It's, it's R, and uh, it's also web-based. I mean, a lot of applications nowadays run on the browsers. And you can put it on a server, which will further enable you to Analyze, analyze like larger data sets. And it's designed to create interactive <coughs> user interface in the front end while R manages those analysis functions in the back end. And you can easily create the project, Shiny project in uh, R Studio. That's, uh, I mean, pretty easy to use IDE instead of like just use like console. And also, we're going to introduce you know, the concept of reactive in Shiny, which makes it pretty easy to do interactive programming. So this is a, a very, very simple, like, Shiny exa example. I'm going to run it, like, locally on my computer to show how, like, how many lines of code you're going to write and what you get from the code. Uh, basically, this application only has two parts. The left side is uh, input, like UI component, which you can drag to choose like how many how many beans you want to use for the histogram. And this just, uh, the graph on the right side like changes like <laughs> according to the sliders. So this is an easy app, but if you're going to write like JavaScript or if you do it in Java, it's still like it still requires some bit of code, but in Shiny, it's only like this. So server side, it's only just these three kind uh, three lines of code, and in UI side, it's actually just this. So I'm gonna go into the details like in <coughs> the next slide. All right. 
So why it's why it's easy to use Shiny to do this because Shiny has something called reactive programming. So what is a reactive a reactivity? Think of uh, uh, Excel spreadsheet. Like when you put a number in one cell and a formula in another cell, like depending on the changes of the previous cell. So this this is the basic idea of reactive. So in Shiny, like uh, what is similar is the input changes get propagated to the output. So basically, Shiny takes care of this instead of like requires you to write the code to handle those events or like finding variables, all this. So it can be used to many more sophisticated use cases than just, you know, in this case, from the input to the output. So to show you what react, how reactive like programming works in our shiny, uh, let's first take a look at the uh, reactive values. What what reactive values are? <laughs> so basically, in shiny, every I mean, all the inputs are reactive values. What is an input in shiny? So since it's for web uh, development, usually you put some UI components at the UI. I mean, the client side. Um, in this case, it's a slider to choose a number. So with this one line, uh, this code here, slide input, you give this uh, UI component an ID called num and a label. <laughs> That's it. So you can grab this input anytime you want, use ID num. So on the right bottom, uh, that line of code is actually run on the server side, which is to querying the uh, value of the input num and put it into uh, uh, like use it to draw the plot. So basically, here what uh, the rea uh, reactive value is uh, input dollar sign num. So every every reactive value have to be paired with a reactive function, and the render plot function is a reactive function. So every time a reactive value changes, it will cause reactions down the data stream. And it can be summarized as reactive value notify and reactive functions respond. So since we already have uh, like reactive expressions, say, or values, you need to write reactive functions to work with it. I'm not going to go through all this list, but the basic idea is these functions are the functions that you use with reactive values. If you want to draw a plot, if you want to part of your applications change while there is an input change or there is a reactive value change. So what we used most are, I would say, the render functions, because after user input all the data sets, we want to draw plots, I mean, from those data we imported. So render plot, uh, render functions are all uh, reactive functions. You can put, you can basically put every reactive value in it. And to for you to create a reactive uh, value, or what we call here is a reactive block uh, expression, is to call reactive function. So Basically, if you write a block of code into uh, in reactive uh, parentheses, this block of code can be used as a reactive expression later in the server side. So once this um, block, uh, this this value changes, the the other part of code that depends on it would change as well. I guess. In this case, say input num is a uh, reactive value. Every time it changes, the render plot will rerun. So, but sometimes you might want, you might not always want that because you say you don't want it to change the title of the graph or a plot every time you type a type a like change the text. Uh, you you. You might want to trigger it only when you click on the button. So to do that, you use isolate to isolate a reactive value from 
from the, the uh, reactive environment. So we also have observe, invent, and observe. Uh, those functions are actually, I would say they are pretty identical, but observe, observe invent, you have to explicitly uh, specify what variables or what events you are observing on. But observe just changes every time like the enclosing, one of the enclosing uh, variable, uh, reactive va variable changes. So we also have invent reactive, uh, which will take an action, uh, will, will actually create an object instead of just performing a, like an operation when, when the enclosing reactive value changes. So for reactive values, it just creates a vector or a list of reactive values. So I'm showing you these functions because I think it might give you intuition that how, how you might be able to apply those programming concepts to like the tools you guys might be working on. Or even if you find it, it's interesting, you want to like, write a function to our Shiny app, that would be cool too. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So <clears throat> how is that approach, the reactive approach that you know, automatically updates your variables uh, different and or better than two-way data binding. Because a lot of web frameworks, they provide you two-way data binding when you, you know, from user interface, it gets propagated on your model. Mm -hmm. From your model, changes in your model gets propagated to user interface. Is there like, I, I see the similarity, but yeah. is there like advantages of this approach? Um, one thing is it's a one-way binding, right? Because you bind this variable to some events, but you don't pass it back. That's one thing. But the other thing is I know there are reactive programming or say like similar concepts in other programming language like in Swift, I, we have like um, variable bindings as well. Uh, we don't use that because we want to use R. That's why we use Shiny because Shiny is basically <coughs> R. We want to do those analysis. That's basically the major reason. It's so not only the reactive thing. Shiny doesn't have to do it. Uh, I mean if you just you don't, you don't have an ex expression to do that, like, uh, but you can just wrap, like, you can uh, define both variables as reactive and include them into the code block you have, like, yeah, on, the, on both sides. Yeah, that would work, I mean, pretty similar to what you said. Uh, Or on the it's both, actually, yeah. But because, like, for the input, like that, like, like that slider we just uh, talked about, it's a UI component which you put in a, a UI side, but it generates a reactive value in server side. In this application, I would say it's a whole application. Yeah, you don't have to figure out, like, you know, where which side is called, like, executed, but that value is available in server side as well. Uh, yeah. uh, images, they are first rendered in server side and then sent to the client side. I would say it's not really rendered or something. It only is, does the calculation and everything, but it actually generates JavaScript. It uses some of the JavaScript library, and those JavaScript scripts would be run in your browser which is a browser's render mechanism to draw these plots. Yeah. So Does that make sense? What is sent to the client is the JavaScripts to yeah. the plots. Yeah, but it's not us to do that. It's all you know, managed by Shiny. Yeah. Yeah. So um, since we have Shiny, we want to use Shiny to work out a solution to solve what we, we what we wanted to basically uh, cross application data exchange uh, data exploration. Uh, also, we wanted yeah we wanted to incorporate different multiple like uh, applications such as Core Map, Ciderscape, and many more. So, since I'm gonna first introduce how Shiny works with Core Map, I think it's a good time to recap, revisit what Core Map is. So uh, the basic, 
basic idea of core map actually is pretty simple. It uses heat map to visualize your data. But uh, what we changed from a static heat map is we uh, included different ontologies or just tree structures to row and column nodes. So basically, you can expand or collapse those nodes. So no matter like how big this heat map is, if you have those tree, those ontologies or clusters on your row side or column side, you can always condense the data into a very small, small like portion. Uh, so you can get like a very high level concept of your data and then dive into a certain part of the data by expanding a certain branch. So that's why we define core map as a heat map plus dynamic row and column ontologies. Yeah. So when when we do like uh, collapsing and expanding, uh, we usually use like uh, an aggregation method to aggregate the values, like mean or just median or something. So we do have some existing data exchange in core map. Uh, I guess that's basically what what we talked about in my last seminar last year, like back to maybe July or something. Uh, so we, ha we have provided data for other applications through our API. Uh, so we can map our uh, nodes to Cytoscape. It's actually using Cytoscape's uh, API to send the data. If, yeah. And we, we can also send a gene list to IGV and also like control the uh, Basic the any animation, uh, create an animation like to control how frequently you send the list, like how many genes you want to uh, send each batch. So um, and we also have uh, the function to map Cytoscape selection to core map, um, but that only works with Cytoscape. And um, basically, we have uh, R. We incorporated R by uh, a core map plugin called just our plugin yeah <laughs> okay yeah we can exchange data between core map and R session we we actually write a console to for you to type like R commands in it and we also enable users to uh, write their own customized R scripts and just include it in core map so core map can dynamically load those scripts and run those scripts for you and show you the results yeah that's what we got for existing data exchange but still, it's not that good. It's, we have something that is absent. So first thing is, we kind of want full access to R. Currently, we actually have that R console where you can type in R commands, which work pretty close to a real R console, but it doesn't have like a lot of like hints or something that that is not too um, too easy to use, uh, and also when we use like plotting functions, it always like got issues because we are using a third party R library to do that. So if we have full access to R, it would be very good to use tons of the analysis and the plotting packages available on our website. And they call it print, um, and also we don't only want like we want like more uh, applications data not only Cytoscape. we want to work <laughs> with uh, other applications as, uh, as well like IGV I mean there are there are like tons of applications because I'm not really a biologist so I I'm not aware of like most of them but I know there are a lot uh, so the other thing we want uh, is absent is uh, the uh, interactivity. So we wanted to create like user-friendly interface to interact with the data set as well as like interactions between different UI components. Because say you draw like uh, some plots in R, which is a static plot, you want to map some of the nodes to core map. What are you gonna do? You, you can do it by maybe saving it to a file and read read it back to core map and then highlight it on it. But you can't do it like just maybe click on one node on the plot and highlight highlight it on the core map. That's something we cannot do. 
we can't do now. Uh, yeah, just that's the same thing we, we just talked about, not only between core memory and uh, another application, but among applications. That means the communication should be not only from core map to core map, map. It can also from one application to the other, like yeah, non-core map application. So here is how we are going to like implement the Shiny and core map communica uh, communication in this Shiny app. So uh, first of all, is uh, core map has a set of APIs uh, that enable uh, applications to get data from and set, uh, send data to core map. Um, and what what we wrote recently is uh, uh, our package called core map R. Uh, this is actually just a wrapper uh, package of the rest uh, restful APIs we uh, we we have already. So users can call this. Uh, functions in this uh, package to just avoid avoid like sending uh, HTTP request, so you don't have to write that explicitly. Um, also, reactive programming is will make it possible to get data from Core Map without manually triggering it. Currently, what we do is like every time you want data from Core Map, you have to call something. But I'll, I'll explain it later. Yeah. So, so first is, I mean, one way is getting data from Core Map. Our current solution is like a polling mechanism. Uh, it gets the data every like once in a while, like 0.5 seconds, and make it available through Reactive. So it it's like the code below. Basic that block of code runs every 500 milliseconds and get the uh, uh, selected nodes from core map and put it into a local variable called select columns or select rows. So this is a, a the good thing about it is uh, the data is constantly available. Like you can access anytime you want. But also it has too much overhead. But, but it has too much overhead. So we are actually thinking about we might need to replace this with a uh, more like a passive mode of fetching data, not like constantly requesting data. <coughs> it's it, it should be something similar to like an event notification of the data change. So we go and grab the data change after the event. But so <coughs> far so far we have been using this and it works fine. But if we incorporate like many more reactive blocks it might cause like our applications to run very slow. So the other way is send data to core map, back to core map. So uh, say we, uh, one example is sometimes we want her to, just as I said, uh, we want her to make those like data points on the, every time we like say we select or brush those data points points on um, on our plots, we wanted to map them back to core map because you want to see, say you find something here that is significant, you want to see what is in the raw data in core map. That's, uh, we have, uh, we done it through reactive expression. So here, the brush points is a shiny, uh, shiny function that grabs uh, the plot, which is the second uh, argument called sample brush, um, get the uh, brush points from this plot and use this as an index back to uh, what you use to draw this plot. Uh, here is a DM, PCAX, norm thing. So you grab those data and so you get maybe those the names of these data points or IDs or something that might be, that is available in core map as well. Then since we define it as a reactive value, the sample rows is a reactive expression, so we can use it in a um, reactive function down here called observe event. So the observe event will observe the value changes in sample rows. Every time, every time user brush 
the plot, the sample rows will change, which cause the uh, observing event, the block of the code under observed event, rerun, which will further uh, set the set uh, send this data back to core map and highlight these nodes in core map by calling core maps API. So here, this slide actually shows how reactive values and reactive functions work together. So for Cytoscape, basically it's the same thing because Cytoscape has this RESTful service as well. But we also, just for convenience, we also wrote this R package called CYR, uh, which we wrapped the original HTTP request in it. Currently, we only have like a couple of commands because that's what we only need. But we are still working on it. And if someone's uh, like interestingly collaborating on it, that, that would be cool. Yeah. So we do need to add more functions like getting network edge information, and also like sometimes you want to get. Um, the neighbor nodes of the selected nodes, functions like that. So what? So after we done core map is shiny and shiny at Ciderscape, how how would it work out? So it's actually being put together like this. So we have uh, basically communication between core map and shiny, like both ways, and uh, shiny was Ciderscape as well. So. These are two-way like communications between those three applications. You might wonder, oh, there is no way, uh, there is n not a way to communicate uh, between Cytoscape and CoreMap. But actually, if you those, if those two red arrows work, then it actually enables the uh, communication between Cytoscape and CoreMap as well. Say you have a data set, and you, I guess. It, it, it's gonna. Uh, it's better if I, like later show the demo. You, you're gonna figure out how they work together to pass data back and forth in those two apps. So the other thing is we made it possible for other applications to just plug in and uh, provide the data to Shiny, so the sh so this data would be available in Shiny, and that means it those data set would be. Data objects would be available to other applications as well. So here you can really see why Shiny is Shiny acts as a central point, like controlling like dispatching operations and getting like data objects, like sending uh, uh, objects back to different applications, and also can aggregate some like analysis results. So here we, uh, I'm I'm gonna show you a demo of um, this shiny prototype. It's really just a prototype. Um, so this uh, demo is about uh, analyzing a microarray dataset using our shiny app and Core Map and Cytoscape. So the the raw data is a normalized microarray dataset, and we're gonna perform the PCA, uh, principal component analysis, to to identify sample outliers, and uh, we gonna, we also going to show uh, lemma differential expression analysis, and uh, in that we're going to uh, examine raw data related to uh, differentially expressed genes, and also we're going to use Ciderscape to examine pathways related to the uh, differential expressed genes. So, so I made the demo a video like so I can show you. So here I open both core map and Cytoscape. Cytoscape is the one below. So in Cytoscape, I included a network called Overall FI Network. It includes uh, uh, mo I mean, almost all the genes in human reactant. It's about one third genes of all the human genes. And also on the left side, it's all the pathways. So first, let's import the uh, gene expression data we have, the data set we have. Uh, this data set have, uh, has uh, 8,000 genes. Um, and yeah, coming from different 
uh, three different brain regions as three uh, the samples are from three different brain regions and also further grouped by uh, group by the glu glucose coordinate uh, receptor overexpression. Yeah, that's a term I'm not really familiar with. <laughs> so the three different regions are CA region and dented gyrus and nucleus uh, um, accumbens. So those things are described in this second file we, we are importing. I think it's, uh, it's pretty, OK, blurred. Um, so here in this table, it's actually the rows are samples, uh, which which are corresponding to the columns we imported in the uh, in the raw data set, in the gene experiment data set. So and the, each column is a property. Most and the most important property might be the uh, might be the brain region property, and also uh, uh, also the uh, Genotype, yeah. Okay. So basically, in this uh, core map application right now, it's uh, the <laughs> gene spreading data with eight thousand genes, eight thousand genes on the row side and the samples on the column side. So let's start our shiny app. So. First, it shows a list of the data objects in core map. On the left side is the data matrix, which is this gene expression data matrix. Second uh, components shows the list of the uh, uh, sample property tables. All right. So if I so basically here I chose to the both data ob objects together and. Uh, Select analysis, and uh, here is a PCA analysis plot. It's a PCA differential. Oh, not differential. Sorry, <laughs> it's a PCA MA. Uh, no, that's not the plot yet. It's just a PCA plot. It's a principal component analysis. Yeah, so it shows. Uh, so so it it's pretty obvious that all the samples are actually mainly grouped by uh, the brain region. So we only show the first two component of the PCA component results, uh, P which is PC1 and PC2. Um, so those two are mainly basically cited by, uh, by the brain region. So here we, uh, I'm trying to say uh, select the first group here, which highlights the different parts. Like you can see like if I select the uh, third one, it highlights all these dented gyrus uh, samples here, which is right. It's a, a, you know, it's supposed to be <coughs> in that region. And here we can see we have three outliers. So if I select those three outliers, which which will highlight the corresponding samples back in core map. So it's pretty good for researchers to validate against the raw data set with, uh, with uh, the plots, with the analysis. So if I deselect, deselect those two, those three, you can see they are, they are liars in core map because it's pretty obvious those three strips are different from what they have like around. So back here, I just chose some different properties to plot. It's, yeah, it doesn't make too much difference. But out of curiosity, if you if you select stuff in Cool Map, mm -hmm. it won't highlight in Shiny, or is that not true? It will. It will. Okay. It depends if we want okay. it to be highlighted. Yeah, but we can do it. Yeah. So now let's go to the uh, Lima differential expression uh, analysis. So first, we need to choose a control group. Since those two brain regions on the side all have uh, like uh, some outliers, so what we're gonna do is to use the dented uh, brain region to do the uh, to do this experiment. So I chose the I chose uh, the non over overexpression samples as the control group and the lifetime. 
as uh, as the treatment group. So here we see the plot. So from from the plot, we only we might be interested in those very highly. So the, basically, the x axis is the average expression of each genes. So we have a, a thousand genes in here. Uh, so the axis is uh, uh, average uh, gene expression value, while uh, while the y-axis is a uh, log fold change between a control and treatment group. So we might want to fo be focused on like genes that has a uh, expression value higher than six and uh, a log fold change over maybe has a uh, more like forty percent more change. So in order to uh, in order to uh, like uh, synchronize the core map view, we need to go to the uh, this tab here and choose this core map view. So this tab is for listing different views in multiple applications. Here you can see uh, this one is Ciderscape's uh, network called over on FI network, we, which we're going to use later. And um, above is uh, the core map view currently displayed. So if we choose that, and if we go back to the Lima plot, if we select this one here, uh, which has a pretty like high change, what we can do is go back to the raw data in core map. It's already automatically selected. We can evaluate uh, if the uh, the the raw data with uh, the analysis here. And we can see the control group here and the treatment group. Uh, I don't think you guys can see the actual names. Yeah, basically, those red ones are treatment group, and those darker ones are the control group. So pretty obvious, it's, it's also true in the raw data. So it's pretty convenient for researchers to validate this like on both sides. So let's jump into the to this, uh, to trying to send those data, uh, genes to Ciderscape. Here, I deselect this uh, core map view and select the Ciderscape view. And I'm going to map all these genes that has a higher expression value and also has a high, higher change to Ciderscape. And in Ciderscape, I'm going to do uh, those genes already mapped here. Those yellow dots are genes sent from this training app. And uh, I did the. Uh, enrichment analysis, like cross the uh, pathways uh, on the left side. And we choose some uh, relatively, like, like uh, pathways that has a relatively high uh, hit, uh, hit genes. Um, here we, I don't know what pathway it is. It might be RNA replication or something. So when we choose this pathway, we can create the pathways network here. With the, the gene network uh, here, and uh, once we have this view, we can go back to choose to choose this view from Cytoscape in the Shiny app, and we can see all these six genes that were mapped <coughs> from Shiny are these six genes. So researchers can further, like maybe evaluate the neighbor genes or go to. Uh, maybe a sub pathway or like a super pathway or something to further just trying uh, trying to figure out maybe a hypothesis or something. So so it's pretty convenient for them to repeat this process over and over again because now all these three applications have uh, interactivity and you don't need to like save something to file and reload it. You just need to change something here and map it to the other application and map it back. Yeah, so that's our prototype now. Uh, it has some issues. As you can see, it's flashing all the time. But um, yeah. Do you know why it's doing that? Uh, we haven't figured out yet, but it might be related to a lot of refresh, like those reactive values, like constantly refreshing the plots. Yeah. yeah. So there, I forgot the name, but there's actually an application. Mm -hmm. What it does is you, it's an R package. You feed your shiny uh, app into it, they and it basically it. creates a map of, like it shows arrows, like what oh, are the reactive good. values. 
So I had the same problem, and I found out why it's doing that because there was a loop. Oh, okay. Like yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So that might help. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the information. Yeah. So our future directions like include something like op optimizing the uh, interactivity, just as what we were talking about. We were talking about like we the. The, the app is actually flashing all the time because we might have some issues. So we might have too many interactive events. We might to want to isolate them or trying to use a different way. And we want to put different highlights efforts uh, uh, effects for different data sources. So like data coming from Ciderscape and the core map, we want to highlight them differently on the plot so we can figure out which, part, which application comes from. And also, we want our users to be able to control individual like data changing directions. Sometimes they want, they might want to disable the synchronization with pool map or Ciderscape. Yeah, we, we're going to allow them to do that. And we wanted to uh, have more applications, and uh, we also wanted to add more data pre-processing and analysis functions. So one other thing is, since we want our other people to write like plugins to these shiny applications, so we wanted to uh, write some code examples and templates for them to fill in their own analysis or put their own applications data into shiny so we can use that data as well. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. <laughs> yeah. So if you want to try CoolMap, that application on the top right corner, you can go to coolmap.org to download it. And if you want to try this shiny prototype, uh, you should contact us. If, you know, we are still working on it. And yeah, just keep, shoot me an email at lkq at Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Any questions, maybe? Questions? So once this is up, are you guys going to host it on your lab server or? That actually requires the thing is we currently want it to run locally because we want to get data from CoolMap because CoolMap is a desktop application, and uh, we might isolate like isolate some functions from this as an individual application one day. Hold it on like a web server or our own web servers or just on our shiny website. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know like so what version of shiny are you using? Basically I should be the current one. The current one? Okay. Yeah. So that's easier because that allows you to make modules. So you oh, as you said you can put one. Yeah. So when I started I was using the previous version which did not allow modules. So it's just once you make the app then that's it. You touch anything it breaks. Okay. But now the as you said, like you can put like the data loading yeah. as a module, yeah. and then use it online. Yeah. Our code right now is, I, I would say, it's still like a little bit messy, but we are trying to, yeah, to be make it easier for other developers as well. Yeah. You, had, you had a slide that showed the different applications and the arrows running between them, uh -huh. and then you had things uh, funneling through Shiny, but then you also had the things communicating with each other. Those if you don't run them through Shiny, don't you lose the reactivity? You do, you okay. do lose it, yeah. But if if you want to still to achieve it, you the solution was actually talked about like uh, in the beginning of my talk. It's you have to write every application or plugin or something like that yeah. to be able to enable the bi bilateral communication. Yeah. Yeah. So so I think that's actually something we have been struggling with. With so we because. Many of our collaborators are bench biologists. So our task is to make their data analysis e easier and more intuitive for them. So they always say, I want to work with this program, work with this program, work with that program. So initially, like we just fo focus on bilateral communication between two apps. So we build a function like Kajang Data in yeah. Cool Map to talk to Cytosafe, to talk to IGV. But as you can see, like when People want to work on more and more programs. So basically, we need to 
uh, do the bilateral thing for each pro program. Mm -hmm. So it makes things really complicated. Yeah. So that's the reason we come to Shiny. So we hope uh, Shiny can be served as kind of a network switchboard. So can control all the com communication and make everything more straightforward. That's actually some, some <coughs> in our lab we did something similar, but for the web development. So we had this problem that we needed some kind of a platform that would allow to take a third party application, plug it in, in a bunch of them, yeah. and then you have like a core platform module. So, and then Shashan was just mentioning having the module, modules modularity really helps. Because what you can do, what we did is we implemented the automated facade. So you take an app, you plug it in, and what, it, the, what the platform does, it traverses the interface, it mm -hmm. finds all the possible methods you can call from that library, okay. and automatically creates a pool of callbacks for it. And so, well, that's cool. and you do it for the second application as well. Now you have two pools of callbacks, uh -huh. and now you just map call which calls which. You I would say that's even cooler because uh, you can discover those services basically, and you have callbacks. You don't need yeah. to implement them manually because uh -huh. they're just automatically pulled. You have to do a course on the back end. You have to coordinate them. Yeah. So all the applications that you plug in, you have to coordinate. Yeah. So we implemented that as a messaging service. We have like a mediator pattern that does like pops up kind of communication. Okay. So each module that is a wrapping application is able to send messages. And then whoever is listening, they accept, respond, accept, and then the whole thing. So what kind of uh, Platform or programming languages you guys use? We did for web, so we. Oh, well, web, ju JavaScript. Like. JavaScript but oh, that's our like, own purpose thing. But con concept is the same. We just published a paper on the oh, that's platform cool. architecture, so we published the, the architecture, so you can like, send your link or something. Okay. Is it fine if I can have your email address so I can sure. talk to you about that as yeah. well? Okay. Because I'm kind of curious about that. Sure. Okay. Thank you sure. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Mm -hmm.